questions already. Well, um, thank you for coming along to this talk. If I'm speaking too quickly for you, please tell me. I do have a tendency to speak far too fast, and as most of you are Swedish and English is not your first language, I know Swedes speak wonderful English. I speak no Swedish at all. Um, so please, if I'm speaking too fast, do tell me and slow down. Um, and as it's a small group, if you have any questions, um, ask them uh, during the talk. There's no need to wait until um, right at the end. So I'm David Crocker from uh, Duet3D. We're a joint venture between two companies, my own, which is called Ashes3D, and Thinkerd Print3D. Um, and together we design and manufacture the Duet Electronics. I'm trying not to sell Duet too strongly today because I really want to talk more widely about um, 32 bit uh, electronics and firmware, and that firmware in particular. So um, it's not meant to be a sales pitch. <laughs> At the moment, uh, well, uh, well uh, yeah, um, we think it is anyway. Okay, so um, start with why do you study the tube electronics? Do you need to? Well, here are some benefits you, you may or may not get. Now, I have to say, if your printer isn't very good at all, if the mechanics are really bad, then no matter how good the electronics you put in it, you are not going to get wonderful prints. Good electronics can't cover up bad mechanics. They can, they can cover up a few little things. Uh, but basically, don't think if you've got a really bad mechanical printer, it's worth putting expensive for. It isn't. If you've got a really cheap budget Chinese printer that's not very good, it's running Arduino RAM, stick with Arduino RAMs. We don't want you having false expectations of uh, uh, making it suddenly wonderful by putting better electronics in it. But here are some things that um, that you can get. Uh, smooth step pulse generation, um, you know, all, both the leading 32 bit firmwares, uh, and in fact, it's more competitive, more than two. Uh, all the leading 32 bit firmwares have this. Um, the traditional 8 bit firmwares use a thing called the Bresnan approximation. Um, now, this was an algorithm designed for drawing straight lines and circles on a pixelated screen. And if what, that's what you're trying to do. It's a fantastic algorithm, it's very cheap to implement. Um, and it'll actually pick the nearest pixels align your drawing. So it's fantastic for that. But that's been used in CNC machines first and then 3D printers. And it's not ideal because what it doesn't give you is a uniform rate of step pulses because it's trying to sort of move each motor one step at a time. Now, if you're in a slow moving CNC machine, that may actually be what you want because the motors are moving slowly and they may react to individual steps or one step, they'll react to individual micro steps or anything. But in 3D printing, you don't really want that. You want smooth motion. And 32-bit um, firmwares don't use person, and they actually calculate the time that each step pulse should be at, depending on where the motor should be. So they generate this smooth motion, which does sound quieter, um, and uh, probably improves the print quality. I say probably because it depends on things like your line width. Obviously, it's a really, really thick line you're printing. You're not going to see any difference. Um, most 32-bit boards have a built-in web interface. So I know you can you can obviously get um, a web interface using uh, Raspberry Pi, not to print, and so on. Um, and those of you who are geeks, go on doing that because an uh, Raspberry Pi is easier to hack than a board. So if you really love playing with Raspberry Pi, I'm not trying to say this is better. I'm saying it's it's simpler, um, especially for new users who don't want to get involved in maintaining two sets of firmware, one on a 3D print board, one on RPI. This is a much simpler solution. Um, it's obviously more restricted than the Raspberry Pi, but it's really, really simple. It's all in the one box and it's instant. Um, you don't have to wait for it to boot up, it's just there. Um, because we've got a lot more processing power in 3D print and 32 bit boards and a lot more RAM, which is actually even more important than processing power in some cases. We can do some quite fancy things. Um, least squares auto calibrated for Delta printers was something that we introduced uh, it's two years ago now. Um, and we're still the only actual electronics that supports that in firmware, although there's now a Raj, um, OptiPrint plugin that can do it and CBC have got one as well. So it's a spread, but we actually have it in firmware. Um, print simulation, I don't think anyone else has quite got that yet. We actually can run a simulation on the board itself. Um, runs at about 50 times actual printing speed, 
and because it's actually running the same code bar the actual movement at the end, produces a very, very accurate simulation time. Um, and one of the things we're going to be doing soon is when printers idle, we'll just go through all the files in your SD card and simulate them all so that you'll know in advance exactly how much each one takes to print. Um, and finally, if you have any need for more motor drivers, more axes, more extruders, um, then because we've got them extra RAM processing power, we can actually drive those without overloading the processor. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to you a bit more about that later. So, so here's some reasons why you might want to. Now, obviously, if you've got a very simple Cartesian printer, these don't apply to you as much, although the, the smooth step pulse generation might make you think quieter. And the web interface, if you haven't got a web interface with an file or something, the web interface is actually one that it completely changes the workflow. Okay, so um, let me go on why use it. Easy configuration. Now, um, oh, can I just ask, um, are any of you already using 32 bit electronics? Anybody with two, three, four? Uh, do the rest of you all have your own 3D printers? Yes? Yep. Uh, great. Um, Okay, if you're using 8-bit firmware, you'll be used to the idea that to configure your firmware, you edit a config dot, configuration of H file, is it? Um, in Arduino, you change a bunch of defines. Um, hope you've got them right. You press a button, it compiles, you hope, if you haven't got the wrong version of Arduino or something, and then uploads to your board. And then you've got your firmware config for your board, you hope. And if you get it wrong, you've got to actually think, what have I changed that's not right, and go back and do it again. 32-bit firmwares, no, you don't do that. 32-bit um, firmwares, um, all the major ones, um, you can configure using a text file on the SD card. So all 32-bit boards, I think I'm saying, all have an SD card built into the board. It's not an add-on with the LCD like it is with um, a lot of 8-bit boards. It's built into the board. Um, and that contains a configuration file on that tells the firmware how to behave. So at boot time, that's read, and that configures the firmware. So you don't have to go and edit and compile and upload the firmware to change the configuration. You just edit the text file, and I'll show you later just how easy that is. So you don't need to rebuild and re-upload the firmware when you want to change the configuration. Um, and we can do this because there's plenty of space in 32, but have all the features in the firmware all the time, even that, you, even that whole pile of ones that are not using it in cost you anything. Um, and uh, as I said, you've got enough memory for advanced features. Now, the Marlin guys done a fantastic job of squeezing every ounce of performance out of um, a 16 megahertz 8 bit processor with 8K of RAM. And really, they've done a fantastic job because it ain't easy. Um, we don't have to do that. We have the luxury of saying we've got more RAM, we've got processing power. How can we use it? What features can we put in? that um, can make use of that, and how can we speed up development? Because we don't have to worry as much about RAM. We do have to worry about performance in some areas. Um, step off generation, performance is still very key. But the number of areas where we've got to be really careful when not overloading the processor is, is basically just reduced the step off generation, which is a great help for um, developing firmware. Um, scriptability. Um, I said that um, you don't have to modify the, um, the firmware source to actually configure it. Um, it's done with text files. Um, and with uh, the firmware I'm talking about, uh, mostly RepRap firmware, a lot of it's done with G-code script files on the SD card, um, which means that as long as you have a rule entry understanding of how G-code works, you can actually change the behavior of the firmware an awful lot without changing the firmware itself. Um, and it's quick and easy to experiment with things because you don't have this compile and upload process every time. Um, you can change things very quickly and try things out. You can actually change it on the fly. Uh, yeah, I'll come that later. Um, okay, other reason, high performance. Um, we've got a lot more processing power, with things like generating step uh, pulses and uh, calculated complex trajectories. Now, on a Cartesian printer, you can argue it's not necessary because an APIC processor is fast enough. Um, but if you're using nonlinear kin kinematics, like Delta printers, the classic one, SCARA printers, then the extra processing power is a great help, and it does mean you can print faster. Um, the machine you see there, that's um, 
a very, very cheap scar of printed that we bought from China from Robot Dick. Um, and it came with Marlin and Matrix Foam, and we, and amazingly, the thing actually printed out of the box once we put it together and fixed a couple of some mechanical issues. Um, and it printed something like uh, 15 to 20 millimeters a second. Um, we bought it basically because we wanted to develop scar of firmware for the duet, and we put a duet in, and we've got it printing uh, easily at double the speed. Beyond that, the mechanics shakes too much, so the limit now is mechanical rather than electrical, but the limit was the electronics. Um, Delta printers, um, the way uh, you went, uh, I think, at Johan um, Rocco actually built pretty much the first open source Delta printers, the console. Um, what he did um, in the firmware was he divided each long move up into lots of little tiny steps and said within each step the motion of each motor is roughly linear because you've got actually it's a quadratic motion of the motors and he said this is a hack but we'll you know, build it a quick and dirty solution and every firmware except 30 bit wrap wrap firmware is still doing that so it's chopping each movement of delta printer up into tiny segments we know um because we can actually calculate solve the quadratic equations in real time and calculate precisely the position of each step cuts now, we can't do anything similar for SCAR yet because it's in it's our cosines and so you've got to calculate. And um, uh, I haven't yet worked out a way of calculating those in real time really, really fast. So we still do segmentation of SCAR, but not on deltas. And this means you, you get these lovely smooth surfaces on delta printers. Um, high step rates. Um, we can generate step passes faster than. Um, uh, any 8 bit board and most of them 2 bit boards. So, this means you can use higher native micro stepping um, than you can with 8 bit controllers. Um, and another thing that's often overlooked um, if you are using USB, all the 32 bit chips have got the USB controller built into the chip. So, you've got a really fast channel for USB. It's not converted to serial and then to USB like it is with um, all the Atmega based boards. And more, more importantly, you've got flow control. So when the PC sends stuff over USB, you've got driver level flow control telling the PC to stop. With um, 8-bit Arduino, um, you haven't got that, and the um, PC has to keep waiting for an OK response, so it knows that it's OK for another command. And that, unfortunately, happens at the application level. And I don't know, if you ever try printing for Windows PC especially over USB, you'll find you just get this stuffing all the time. With a dedicated host like Octoprint, you can avoid it if you configure the system properly. Um, but, but then USB, um, if you want a network interface, um, as most of the ports have, you basically don't use USB um, because the network's so much better. Um, yeah, and as I said, more flexible firmware development because we are not having to think about performance all the time, most of the time. We can do fast development. Um, we've just gone to a real-time operating system in RepRap firmware, which again makes some sort of firmware tasks just so much easier to do because we don't have to think about fitting stuff into a main loop and making sure it doesn't take too long to execute. Um, we're often the first to market with advanced features, not always, but very often. Um, I think it was about a year ago, a little bit more, uh, Marley introduced the linear advanced facility. We had it three years ago. We didn't call it linear advanced, we just called it pressure advanced, but it's linear, so. Things Marlin's um, is. Okay, so uh, any disadvantages? Um, the one people often cite is cost. Um, well, there aren't any really, really, really cheap 32 bit boards, um, but there are some cheap ones. Um, now, in 8 bit, if you, okay, um, I've left up after the 11 rounds because it has too many technical issues, really. Um, I've gone for like the lowest cost 8 bit board that works reasonably, and um, they're about $29 if you buy them from Amazon. A little bit less if you search eBay, it's getting a bit less. You can get a 32 bit one, um, this is the MKSS base for $40. Now, I don't recommend that board, partly because it's not a duet, but also because it's a rip off of a smoothie board, uh, completely violates the GPO. If you buy one, the smoothie wear folks won't appreciate you for buying it and they will tell you to go to MKS for support first and reluctantly when you've tried that and MKS haven't given you any because like every Chinese manufacturer zero support then reluctantly you, you may get support out of it. 
Um, so even if you don't want to buy um, a duet, I'd say if you must go for a smoothie board, then go for either Jen's smoothie board or one that's basically is contributing towards the smoothie product um, uh, uh, and um, is fully open source the way smoothie went, smoothie board was. Um, but if you look at good 8-bit boards, um, the genuine I see, um, it's actually come down in price recently, and I'm quite surprised they can say it as cheap as $120. Um, the, the Rambo, I think, is still $150. Um, and genuine duet wide flight, because there are some Chinese clones now, uh, is $169, so um, a bit more. But you've got to remember that the, the INC is still an 8 bit board. Um, it's got four stepper drivers. We've got five stepper drivers, which take, can do double the current of the um, 2130. And you've got the Wi Fi interface as well, which you can do with the INC. So, um, oh, and the other thing um, is that um, if you want something a bit cheaper, there's this, which is not available yet, but will be announced in a week's time, which is a lower cost duet. Um, which is only a little bit more than the ANC, and of course has the network interface decent in this case. What does it not have? Um, it has um, lower current stepper drivers, that's the main thing, and it's less expandable. Um, it's got five onboard drivers and you can add two external, whereas with the duet you can go up to, um, it's got five internal and you can add to seven external. And there are people using seven saying, please come have them. Um, so what I'm saying is that if you're buying a like for like, 32 bit boards don't actually cost more if you do a like for like comparison, which is which is quite right because the at mega 2560 chip actually costs more than a modern 32 bit ARM chip that is 15 times more powerful. You know, the, the 2560 is a legacy chip. Microchip pricing at high because they didn't really want to go on making it, and because basically almost nobody apart from 3D printer makers is using it anymore. Everyone's migrated to ARM because they're much more powerful um, and they're cheaper. And indeed, the 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 ARM three chip on the um, Arduino Duet that's now part of the legacy chip. ARM four is now um, where it's at with regard to price. Uh, but anyway, I think the uh, the main thing I see is five or six dollars a um, thousand off if you go to microchip site, and the chip using this is about half the price. So 32-bit boards should be even cheaper than 8-bit boards if you the same features. But because there's so many Chinese phone companies making 8-bit boards and the Arduino and Mega and in particular, they're not yet. Um, disadvantages, well, if you're used to the way 8-bit firmware works, there is a learning curve because the way you configure um, 32 bit firmware is different. It's all done in the text file. So if you spent years learning all these defined Marlin, you've got, well, I mean, if you went for a pet here, they'd be different anyway, but um, they are different because you've got a text file instead to configure in to any 32 bit, any, any modern 32 bit firmware. It's written for 32 bit firmware, 32 bit processors. It's a text file configuration instead. So there is some learning. Okay, so um, now I'm going to talk about different firmwares and RepRap firmware in particular. There's um, probably three main 32-bit firmwares. There's um, RepRap firmware, there's uh, Smoothieware, uh, and there's Redeem. Uh, and um, RepRap firmware and Smoothieware were developed about the same time. Um, RepRap Firmware was originally designed by Adrian Barrier, who, uh, as many of you will know, was the person who made 3D printing um, popular and open source because he designed the original RepRap self replicating machines um, and um, did the original electronics and firmware to run them. And um, he decided in uh, 2013 they wanted this company wanted to use a new printer with a web interface, 50 bit electronics. And they felt that the existing 8-bit firmwares weren't right for 32-bit processor because as long as you're designed within the limitations of an 8-bit processor, you're missing out. So he's developed a RepRap firmware. Um, and although it's moved on hugely since then, um, it is basically, um, in terms of some of the architecture, um, the firmware he wrote, and there's bits of his original code in there still. Um, mature and continuously developed. Um, we're no longer dependent on the community to the core features because 
at the ongoing development of Rep Raptor, where he is now funded from sales of duet series boards. Um, we're selling enough duets that um, I'm basically, um, my full-time job now is um, doing occasional electronic design, but mostly um, rep, rep firmware, um, to put in the features that people like you ask for. Um, the Duet web control user interface, um, you, and you've got to use it to realize how good it is. It is um, more tightly coupled to the firmware than Optiprinters because we've got interfaces in there that can provide more, even more information than Optiprint can get out of uh, a traditional APIA board. So there's an awful lot of things in there, and um, um, I, I'll show you some of the next if you're interested. Um, versatile, because we have these macro facilities, you can do an awful lot of stuff just by scripting macros. Very, very few people who use Duet to build the firmware themselves. The people who build sort of techies who like hacking firmware and doing cool things. Uh, but if you're not into firmware, you can do an awful lot just by doing um, macro scripting. Um, we've chosen an object oriented design for key points. Now, I'm, I'm not one of these people who says everything's got to be your own. That in embedded software, no, it hasn't. But there's certain areas where it really helps. Um, kinematics. Um, our kinematics is now dealt with by an object hierarchy. So if you've, you've got this wonderful new print design that needs different kinematics, um, you know, hand print is a classic one. Um, I had hand print kinematics in about a day because. Uh, all it means is you add a new kinematics class and implement some virtual functions in it. So if people do want to hack the firmware, um, you can add other kinematics very easily just by tapping into the existing interface without uh, having to change a whole lot of different places um, in the code. And the same goes for temperature sensors and, and filament monitors. We've done the same thing because we know people like adding different sorts of them. Um, and uh, we support a wide range of prototypes and configurations. Um, I'll uh, come through them. So here's some examples. Uh, these are sort of commercial kits and machines that are using um, RepRap firmware. And in fact, they're all using duets um, to control them. Um, I think Altibots are one of our first uh, well-known kit manufacturers. So they make this big delta, which is controlled by duet. And CMC have now, with their new machine, the Artemis, they're using a duet. Um, and um, their Rostock, they've gone to, onto a new version, which again is using a duet to control it. Uh, and basically, they, they, they've done this because um, they recognize to get good speed over there from really good print quality, 32 bit boards have the edge. And again, the automatic calibration of the Delta printers that's really, really fast. Um, let me know if something they wanted. And they went for us rather than going with Alpha Machine, who and themselves have brought out some 32 bit boards now, uh, but it's got no web interface. Um, okay, if those aren't big enough for you, big delta. So, this is a delta for um, a uh, company in the Netherlands called Tractor 3D. Um, and if you want to see how big it really is, that's the printer there. Uh, I, I don't know how much of the car is printed, but <laughs> I presume some of it at all it wouldn't be there. Uh, that's, I think, their biggest one. It's 3.5 million. Oh, that might, might be the second biggest actually, but they've got a 3.5 meter tall one. Um, and um, most of their printers, I'm not sure about that one, are actually driving the stepper motors straight from Duet Electronics because the Duet Electronics can handle near the 23 motors very easily as long as you're careful choosing the right calibration. Uh, what else have you got? Okay, Core XY, I, I expect most of you have seen the U3D tool chamber. Um, on their site, um, and um, they use duet electronics partly because uh, they need a lot of um, stepper motors because they've got four extruders. Uh, they also need a lot of fans. Um, we have uh, it, eight and no, nine fan connectors if you put the expansion board on. They're using all of them. They've asked us, can we have some more? Because of course they've got a fan on each of the hot ends, and they don't want all fans running all the time. They want to have run the fan on just the hot end they're using to keep the thing quiet. So each of those hot ends has an independent fan. They've got a control to turn the vacuum um, uh, cleaner on to when they're priming nozzles. Um, they've got some cool down fans, I think. Anyway, um, and um, any idea how much you think they modified the, the firmware to drive that tool changer? Nothing at all. They're using our standard firmware binary. They've done. All the tool changing stuff is scripted in the tool change macros that um, 
And that's a feature that Adrian Bowie had probably never written on it. Um, it's been there for you know, like four years. Um, and this uh, one on the left, that's uh, the rail core two. I didn't think there's one of those here, um, but that's um, again an open source core XY design, and you can use it with any electronics. Um, but they're recommending Duet um, for various reasons, um, and it's, it's a very nice design. Um, what else? Here's another large printer that one of our OEMs does. Um, uh, this is a TTG uh, show in London. I can't remember the exact sizes. They are using external set of grinders, um, drive that step server grinders, in fact. Um, okay, and um, this is uh, Michael's company, uh, Michael here, um, has this company that um, prints houses um, from, well, he, 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 his company does printers that print houses in concrete. Uh, and this is um, a four axis um, printer because. One of the things you have to do when you're printing concrete is you need the print head to remain tangential to the line you're printing in. So you've got to rotate it. So that's a fourth axis. And again, because we support up to nine axes in RepRap firmware, um, that was easy to work. You have to do a bit of work on the G code to make it, to provide the fourth axis. Um, so um, it's it's in use in a wide range of printers, and because there's lots and lots of um, people with um, more conventional Letters or XY cards and printers using RepRap firmware. So, uh, what other types can you run RepRap firmware on? Um, here's uh, an almost complete list. Um, the current boards that Duet3D makes are the Ethernet and the Wi Fi. Those are the same board, but one's got a Wi Fi interface, one's got a network interface. And just say, if your Wi Fi signal is strong, you have an Ethernet locally, use the Wi Fi. If your Wi Fi signal is weak, um, you know, the Wi-Fi model we use isn't the best Wi-Fi model there is. Um, it does like a strong signal, so you've got a really weak signal, or if you wire up to Ethernet anyway, then the Ethernet possibly makes more sense. And in an industrial environment, the Ethernet's probably makes more sense because people don't like Wi-Fi. Um, we don't print over the Wi-Fi, we upload files to the SD card over the Wi-Fi, so if you know, the cable dropout doesn't matter, you're not going to lose a print because it drops out. The print will carry on even if you turn the interface off. Um, Duet2 Maestro, so that's the one um, I've got here, which is, um, uh, again, it's, it's almost as powerful, but less expandable. Um, you know, the stepper motors in these two here will handle 2.4 amps peak. They're, they'll do two amps with no extra cooling at all. 2.4 amps with a fan cooling, and we limit it in stacking firmware. Whereas the this one, the TMC2224, by the way, it's the same as the TMC2208, for those of you who know about that. It's got second generation um, stealth drop loading, um, which is specially designed for 3D printers. It overcomes some limitations of the stealth drop one that you've got in the TMC2130s. Um, oh, the, the, these two, again, you've got stall detection built in, uh, the 2660s. Um, the, the, the Micro hasn't. Uh, but it has got these and later chips. Uh, these are sort of old duets. Uh, you can still buy the 06, I think, from uh, Rekvac Limited. Um, but these are basically, that's the original duet, the 06, and that was a later one that um, was done with its out of production now because it's been replaced. Um, there are some um, boards you can plug into Arduino Due. Um, the RAMS is the one that's best known. There's another one called Smart RAMS, which is can run right up to them as well. Um, these are less powerful, they've got less RAM, and they don't come with a network interface. Um, and since a network interface is such a big advantage, you're losing part of the benefit. Uh, on the other hand, you do get plug-in stepper drivers, and some people prefer plug-in stepper drivers. Um, we don't, but um, some people do. I guess it means you can play with different ones. Um, and someone's recently done a port of RepRap firmware to run on, and smoothie board in the rear and other boards that are based on the LPC 1768 chip. It probably even went on the um, MPSS space for that map as well. Um, it's an experimental port, but you do get easing up some of the boards. Um, the RAM's a little bit tight. It's got half the RAM of a, of a modern duet on, so they, they, they're a little bit short of RAM, and it's not as fully featured as um, on the other ones. Um, and if any of you have got an old alligator board lying around, I, I don't think you can buy those anymore, but they'll run right back to them as well. Um, and then we've got some um, experimental ports for your know, later board that run an even more powerful chip than the Samsung. So uh, that, that's an overview of uh, boards that run that firmware. Um, 
basically it's, it's aimed at, at Merrill strip microchips, ARM based processors, and that's what it's easily brought into. But so the, the guys who've done the LPC port have done a very good job of doing that, so, especially in the limited RAM. So, what changes should you expect if, if you're migrating a printer from 8 bit like from firmware to 32 bit, we'll turn that in particular? What should you expect? Um, so, I'll, I'll run through these in a moment. Uh, G code everywhere is a philosophy of rep wrap firmware. It's um, uh, it was Adrian um, Bowie's original philosophy when he wrote um, the original rep wrap firmware. Basically, everything is configured with G code. So there's a lot of extra decodes for configuration, some of which you get in other firmware, but a lot of which you don't. Um, and the main configuration is done in a file called config.g, which is a G-code script, run at boot time. But because it's all G-code, you can send me all these G-codes anytime you want. So you can try out a different configuration without, even reboot, without having to even reboot the printer. Um, I have a Cartesian printer, but of course I have to support Core XY as well. So I have a script that homes the Cartesian printer, puts the head in the middle, then changes the over to Core XY, which acts as a sort of diagonal Core XY printer so I can test Core XY movement. Now that's a fairly specialized requirement, but it just shows the flexibility um, you get from configuring G-codes. Um, uh, you can change anything virtually on the fly. Uh, by sending the right G-code command to you, even in the middle of printing many places. Um, installing upgrading firmware is different, um, and with a web interface, uh, if you're used to not having a web interface, things are very different and yeah, a lot better. Okay. Um, so I build a machine for a client, and he changes the configuration on the fly. If it needs nice prints with smooth acceleration and nice surfaces, mm -hmm. we just want to jam something through really quickly. So there's a macro for that. Change yeah. it into oh, yeah, yes, yes, the other thing I should have said that apart from all the system macros run automatically, you can put your own macros on the SD card as well, and they will appear in the web interface and the LCD if you have one. So you can set up macros for just about anything. Uh, here's an example of G code everywhere. Suppose you, um, okay, this is a little bit of the web interface as the home all button, of course. Um, this is the option LCD um, touch screen with, with home button on, um, and here's some start G code in your um, uh, slicer start script. Any of these, you run them, um, and basically it runs homing files on the SD card. So it says, how do I own the printer? Uh, let's look for a homing file for home this axis or these axes. Uh, and here is a um, script. This one is for what's this? Um, Ah, this is an interesting one because this one looks like it's for a, um, a four-axis printer because it's homing X, Y, and U all at once. Um, that might be an independent dual, dual X card machine, I'm not sure. Um, but it runs the script, so this says raise the um, head four millimeters to clear, make sure it's clear of the bed. Home X, Y, and U simultaneously all quite fast. Back them off it from the end stops. Home them slowly. Um, and then home Z using a Z probe. So you can make your own home scripts up. If you add an extra axes, you can add homing files to home those as well. Um, all without having to change the firmware. Um, so um, how do you actually do this? Well, you can actually use the web interface to edit these files. You don't have to take the SD card out and copy thing over the PC. You can just, in the web interface, go into the system files editor, and it'll list all these system files, and you just click on the one you want, and open the editor. And um, I think if I press that again, yeah, here's an example of what pops up, pop up you get. Uh, this is the home file for Delta printer. Um, and um, you make your changes, save it, try it out. If it's not quite right, just do it again. It's just extremely quick, say, so no uploading firmware again. Uh, make the change and try re home. You haven't even got to reboot the printer. It's your home file you're changing. You just re home and see what happens. And um, of course, if you're playing around, reduce the motor currents, no pops to twiddle. Of course, on 32 bit, well, just about every 32 bit board, you've got software control motor currents. We always say if you're experimenting, turn the currents down a bit so if things does go wrong, it's not going to run into your mechanical uh, into uh, the limits. Um, and when you wait, wind the current back up, up to normal again. 
then again, there's a demand for temporarily reducing current if you want as well, which is quite interesting for me. Um, okay, it's all an upgrade in firmware. So, okay, I think you've got experience with 8 bit firmware. So, you open Arduino and you edit this configuration of H5, you look for the thing you want, um, then compile and upload. Um, RepRap firmware. Um, if you want to upgrade your firmware, um, all you do is download a new binary from um, the GitHub site where we publish it. Uh, it's one binary for any particular controller board, regardless of configuration of the printer. So the same binaries as Delta and Core XY and Sky and Land Printer and Core XYU and Core XYUV and then um, Pelgrim as well. Um, it's not a separate binary for each one. It's one binary for everything, basically, that we think more than about one person is going to use. And we have even got some features that only one person uses too. Um, you download the binary from our server onto your PC, and then you just upload it through the web interface. And the firm will say, ah, oh, this is the firmware file. Would you like me to install it? Um, yeah, so it up uploads the file. Um, and it's only a few seconds because the upload speed is um, quite fast. And then they'll ask you this question, do you want to update it? You just say yes. Um, and uh, it takes about 15 seconds. And you're on a new firmware. And because it reads the configuration off your um, config.u text file, it's automatically configured already, um, unless we've made a change that changes the behavior. We occasionally do in the firmware. We feel we've got something wrong, in which case we'll tell you in the upgrade notes. What you might need to change. We try not to do that too often. Um, so that's how you upgrade firmware. Really, really simple and quick. And if you have to downgrade again for any reason, it's just as easy again. Uh, right. So have I pressed the wrong button? Possibly. Oh, yeah. And, and the, the result, the end result is that the software information in the um, web interface has been updated. Uh, configuring uh, firmware, so again, with AVIS firmware, you're going to edit this file and compile and upload. Um, with RepRap firmware, all you do is go into the um, system files editor, click on the config.u file, and you edit in your web browser. Um, and the editor's done over the network. You, you're editing locally, and it saves the when you say save, it sends the file back to the cloud again. So uh, again, really, really quick if you are, are making change um, to the configuration. Um, and again, here's an example of changing config.g, um, you're defining where your end stops are, are they high end, low end, what sort of active, high active, low, are they micro switches, stall detect, or something else. Um, and then you just say save changes, and it's uh, saved to the SD card. One thing you can't do with RepRap Firm is run it without the SD card because that's where all the macros live. Uh, oh, um, for first time configuration, now we, we recognize we, we're not going to make you write a whole lot of G code to configure your firmware in the first instance. So, just like uh, I mean, Repetier has got a config web based configurator for, um, uh, in their case, generating a configurable H file, we have a, um, an online web tool for generating your initial config.g, homing files, pause and resume files. So you just um, go to a um, uh, website where we provide this tool, enter the parameters um, for your printer, you can have the sections there for saying what you want, uh, what sort of end stops you've got, what type of loaders you've got, uh, what uh, bed conversation if any you want to use, um, what network parameters you want to use, and then you say finish, and it generates a zip file with all the config, um, File, home files in it, you upload the zip file and it unpacks it for and puts them in the right place. Here we try to make it easy for you. Um, and um, okay, so this, this is a, um, how the web interface might look on a PC. Um, there's several pages of it. Um, at the end, this tells you what your tool needs to doing, temperature chart showing you what the temperatures have been. Uh, your positions. Um, oh, yeah, the, the duets have got a voltage monitor uh, on board. And that's, we put that on there so that you can do um, power panic. 
So um, if we detect the voltage has gone down below a limit, we can actually save the state of the machine. And again, the, the, the duets have got um, power reserve to make sure you can do that on the SD card. Um, you do have to be using 24 volt power to use that. It's not like to work on 12 volt power because you've got, just got not enough reserve to move the stepper motor because you need to at least retract the filament and lift the head um, to clear your print. Otherwise, you'll probably be your hot end of the print if you just stop it. Um, and um, yeah, you can try it on the fly. So here is um, an example where um, someone could read this sort of um, low to high because it's probably the most recent. Uh, the accelerations were 2,000, and here they've been increased to 3,000 um, to try some, something out, and then they've gone back to 2,000 here. And um, let's say, because it's everything controlled by G code, anything virtual. I think the one thing you can't change on the fly is the IP address of the network. To do that, you've got to change it, and then you've got to stop and restart the network. Uh, but anything else on the MAC address as well as the network, but just anything else you can change on the fly. Um, and um, see how it goes, even in the middle of the print. When, when you change on the fly, uh, if you would turn off the print and turn it on, it would not be stored. You would, you would, would you have to use a command to save it, or would it be? To, 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 to when you do what? Mm -hmm. so if you uh, do a change, yeah. and if you power down, it's not saved. If you do a change on the fly, it's not saved. Oh. Now, there are some changes that if you do an M500, it'll be saved to a config override.g file. Uh, there's, oh, the only changes we actually use that file for are ones where we find settings automatically. So things like, um, if you auto calibrate it over the printer, uh, you can save those with M500. If you, when you tune your heaters, yeah. we can save that with M500. Um, but basically, things like acceleration, we'd say try it out during a print when you know what you want. Go in the system file there to put them in config.g and then there. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, typical workflow. Now, um, if you've got an 8 bit printer you, um, without something like a Raspberry Pi or to an add on, then you're probably, probably already found out that printing over USB doesn't give you very good prints. Um, you tend to get stalls. Those of you running a Linux PC, you can configure it probably um, so that uh, nothing else is going to get in the way and, and you may get some results that way. With Windows, you haven't got a hope because it will do stuff in the background you don't want to do. Um, so, probably you're printing from SD card, you're probably writing the SD card in your PC, taking it out, going over to your printer, putting it in, and printing it from the LC control panel. That's how most people without a network interface do their printing. With a network interface, you don't do that. Um, what you do is you, um, okay, you run your slicer on your PC as usual. And then, depending on whether your slicer is supported or not, you either turn your slicer to upload straight to the duet, and there's plugins for, um, I think it's Cura, um, and it's either S3D or Slicer has got one as well, um, but I forget which one it is. But if it hasn't, you save it to file and you go into our web interface and say upload G code file or say upload and print if you may want to print straight away. And it'll upload it to the SD card. The upload, um, that's a typical upload speed, by the way, a bit under a megabyte per second. The Wi Fi and the um, Ethernet are both about the same speed. Uh, indeed, more later ones, I'm getting more than a megabyte now. So, um, you know, a, a 10 megabyte file is fairly typical for what people print. Um, it takes 10 seconds to upload. It's quick. It's quicker than taking the card out and walking across. Um, and then that goes on the SD card. And if you set upload and print, it'll print it straight away while it's sitting on the SD card ready for you to run. Um, and you can print it. I've mentioned you can simulate it, which lets you run the thing, everything bar the movement at the end, so it'll tell you how long it'll take very accurately to print. Because it knows exactly how the movement's going to be computed to do the same computation, just not bother hearing a separate logic answers. So that's the workflow, and it, it's just, just so quick and easy. Um, I'm trying to get to next. Um, Okay, managing one from the printer, again, if you've got um, an 8 bit processor, um, an 8 you've probably got something like that with an SD card and a, maybe a 4 on Texas display, maybe the monochrome graphics display. 
Um, and you're very likely using um, some of that prompt face to control it over USB when you're doing anything that the LCD can't do. Uh, with Duet, um, the primary way of using it is the web interface. And this will run on a PC, it will also run on a tablet or a smartphone. And you can actually access your printer from several devices at once if you want to. So you can have your PC to do the uploading and the main stuff. But if you're leaving the print going, you can check it from another room on your smartphone, see how it's going. Uh, oh, by the way, you can um, put um, a webcam interface into the um, web interface as well. The webcam doesn't get into do it. Um, it, it. It's not quite as fancy as Octoprint. You have to use an IP webcam, and then you configure the um, a setting in, in the web interface to say the IP address to fetch the images from. Um, we do sell a touch screen, uh, uh, color touch screen for the um, Duet. This is, um, yeah, that's a seven inch one. It comes in three sizes. Um, and you can do you can do actually anything on this because if you press that console button, you can attach keyboards. So you can even edit G codes from it. Um, but obviously, if you're doing a lot of serious stuff with G codes, you probably at the end, um, you're better off with a full web interface anyway. And because this works so well on a smartphone or tablet, it'll a lot of people don't bother having an LCD screen. Uh, they use their smartphones if they don't want to use the PC to, to control it. Uh, and again, with a good web interface, especially with multi-device access, you can do that. Um, or a tablet, again, um, works really, really well with it. Um, and you know, the layout will all rearrange itself to suit a portrait orientation of smartphone. Um, Okay, oh yeah, that's an example of uh, what the web interface looks like um, on a smartphone. So uh, you might have to press a few more buttons to get some of the things you want, but um, this, you can do exactly the same thing on a smartphone, just with perhaps a bit of the scrolling occasionally to get it be less frequently used. Um, so um, that's the end of the slide. So in engineering terms, I say, no engineer in their right mind uh, would actually run a 3D printer controller board around an 8-bit process these days because they're expensive um, and the 32-bit ones cost less and they do far more. Um, but because Arduino ramps clones in particular are so cheap, 8-bit um, electronics is still very popular for budget printers because all the Chinese kits tend to use Arduino ramps or, or one of the really cheap 8-bit. Um, uh, and boards. 32 bit electronics and throw away, it's a lot more possible and faster to develop, um, which I think is a real, real advantage. It, 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 it can go a lot further. Um, and if you look at migrating an existing print 32 bit electronics, it's not difficult, but you do have to unlearn the way you're used to configuring the printer with um, editing like the and uploading and so on. You have to learn which G codes you're interested in, obviously it's wiki pages to tell you all the G codes, there's guys they have to do various things. But there is a learning curve. I can't say it's instant or well, instantly fire do everything. You won't, you will have to actually learn the network on two questions on the forum. But people who did it before, um, if you're doing slightly complicated things. Um, but if you want once you've got through that learning curve, you'll find there's an awful lot you can do. Um, now I focus on RepRap firmware because I said we're not the only firmware. Smoothieware is another one that was developed at the same time. That runs on Smoothie Board and Realm and then KSS Base reluctantly and uh, mm -hmm. um, one of other things as well. As TNX5, that's another one that runs that. Um, Smoothieware, um, okay, they're our competitor, um, but I have to say they're a great bunch of guys. They're, they're, they're very talented. They've done more work on CNC machines than we have in Duet. CNC is a bit new for Duets. Um, we're increasing the support, whereas the Smoothie Web folks have got quite a long history of driving CNC machines, so they're a bit ahead of us in that respect. We're ahead of them with 3D printing because we've got the stall attacks and the, um, the pressure advance and one of the second secretary government and a few other things. So I would say in 3D printing, we're somewhat ahead of Smoothie Web now. The CNC that's still ahead of us. Um, I've not claimed really mentioned Redeem, that's designed for London Linux. Um, I won't tell you more about it because we know enough about it. Um, other than I know there were people who've chosen us rather than them. So things change. Um, 
I can demonstrate um, some things if any of you want to, but let's um, have any questions first. Does anyone think I've been unfair to any of the competition? <laughs> yes. I'm just curious, would it be possible to load two printers from one? From one controller? From one controller. Um, you mean two printers printing different things? Yes. On the present generation, no. Um, because um, we don't, we, uh, the present generation of US doesn't really have enough RAM for us to run two complete um, uh, G code queues concurrently. Now, on the next generation, we are going to run at least two concurrently. Um, apart from anything else, we one th we have one thread looking ahead and anticipating, oh, there's a tool change coming up there, and that's not preheating that tool. And things like that. And another thing you can do, um, if you're using a mixing um, hot end like the diamond, um, when you want to change the color mix, it takes a while for the new color mix to get through. And um, at the moment, with existing firmwares, you have to purge quite a lot of material every time you change color. But in fact, you don't need to do that because if you say, "Ah, I've got a new, I've got a color change coming up," and you know that it takes. Um, maybe 10 millimeters of filament you've got to feed through, and then there's a millimeter where it's a bit of a mess, and then it's a new color. Then um, there's a guy who's actually written a thing that modifies the G code that does the tool change in the run. But we're going to be doing that in the firmware in the next generation. So we'll say, ah, there's a tool change coming, color change coming up, and we know it's going to take this much filament. So we will actually advance the tool change by 10 minutes, 12 minutes, however much it is. Uh, so you need to then you need to do a one millimeter purge, or of course, if you can actually do the do it in the infill, then great, you need to do at all. Um, so uh, we're going to be running um, multiple threads for that, and because we do that, um, if you've got enough set of motors, yes, we could run um, two printers concurrently um, with with one board. Um, if you've got enough expansion, and again, the new board is going to be even more expanded than this one. Um, the, the present duets do um, up to 12 step motors, um, and already it was it was supposed to be 10, um, and people ran out of 10, and so we repurposed to connect. It was meant for a low cost LED LCD display. To so, right, okay, that's for two months of the <laughs> um, And then we so we've got a guy who's actually modifying the firmware to. Convert some of the heat control pins to be more step of five pins because he wants 30. What's the new board? Do you oh, the new board. Um, the, the new board is, isn't going to be till the end of this year or very much the beginning of next year. Um, that's that one. I mean, this board isn't coming out in just over a week's time. This is the low cost one. Um, but the, the, the board that takes us beyond what we can do at the moment with the US is um, at least six months away. The way things slip, it's probably going to be more. Um, yeah, so oh. don't, don't hold your breath. Don't let it stop you buying a half, do that Wi Fi, do a decent set. And again, we'll go on selling do it Wi Fi, do a decent set um, because the, the new board may not be the best um, cost performance um, ratio for everybody. For the guy, people who want massive expansion or to do complicated things like that with two printers, it'll be really great. Um, it will probably cost a bit more. Than, um, than the duet will cost by then um, for for print for people doing less ex, uh, less complicated things. Uh, but if you uh, are looking for a budget board and you don't need to drive high price motors, then this board that's going to start becoming available in maybe a month, maybe the thing you want if you don't want the high current and, and stall detection that the um, existing duets do. Yes. Will you be here tomorrow? I will indeed be here tomorrow. And, uh, could you? <laughs> I just bought a new Wi-Fi, so maybe you can actually yeah. unlearn and. Of course, oh yeah, of course. And I've got a laptop here. Like, um, I've actually got this hooked up to um to this this new but this the Maestro board, just in case you did actually want to see the thing running live. The USB is only providing power, by the way. It's Ethernet that we um, um, I'm controlling it over because this thing hasn't got any uh, 12 or 24 volt power going into it. Just one more question. Yeah. Apart from this power panic feature that didn't work with the 12 volt, is there any other reason apart from yeah to use 24 volt? To use 24 volt. Uh, okay. This this is not specific to 
duets at all. But um, there's there's three advantages that I can think of at the moment um, of using 24 volts. One is if your bed heat is more than about 200 millimeters square, then the current gets awfully high if you use 12 volt. By using 24 volt power for the bed heater, um, you halve the current and it becomes much easier to switch. Oh, by the way, the, the, the duets will switch 18 amps of bed current. That's the rate, even this one. Um, we, we, we've yet to fail our test to prove that it will do 18 amps comfortably. It's designed to do 18 amps, which is all, almost double what an Arduino ramp can do. Um, but yes, the bed heater is one. Obviously, if you use an AC main to power bed heater, as some people do, then that's not a consideration. So that's one thing. If you're pretty bigger than 200 by 200, think about it just for the bed heater anyway. Um, power panic if you are using it. Um, I mean, um, we typically set it to um, like 22, 23 volts, so that um, when the power drops below that, you've got quite a lot of power left before it drops to 9.5 volts, which is where we shut off the step of drivers. Because the step drive and sales will shut off if you go much below that. We'd rather have a controlled shut off than, a, um, than the one where you don't know quite where it is. So that's the second reason. Third reason is down to motor speeds. The um, speed at which a stepper motor um, stops producing the maximum torque depends on the supply voltage to the drivers. Um, so if you need high speeds, then it makes sense to use 24 volts. Now there's a calculator on our configurator site which will tell you, you, you feed in the stepper motor parameters, things like the holding torque, um, the current, the resistance and most what is the inductance. Um, you feed in your supply voltage you're supposed to use and your target speed, and we will tell you, um, well, in fact, we'll tell you what is the maximum, oh, you set millimeters, of course, as well. And we will tell you what's the maximum speed you can get um, before the, the, the amount of motor torque starts reducing because you don't have enough driver voltage. And if you're making a delta printer using 0.9 degree motors, especially, uh, you're quite likely to hit speed limits if you don't design it carefully. Basically, don't make a delta with 0.9 degree motors unless you're using 24 volt power. So a Cartesian core XY is less critical when you're looking for the really high speeds. If it's a really big printer where you have a chance to get to a really high speed in the middle of a travel move, then high speeds may be worth your while, in which case, yeah, do the sums and for a big print you want to use 20 volt volts anyway. Mean, 12 volts. Huh? Um, no, the present duets we rate them at 25. Oh. It's because the uh, the high current stepper drivers we're using are rated for 30 volts, and we want to have a bit of a margin there. And we actually shut the stepper drivers down to protect 29.5 volts because the stepper motors will actually stand more voltage if you shut them off. So we do that to protect them. But we say 25 volts maximum intended voltage. Um, the um, the duet ratio will go up to 30 uh, because it's doing stepper drives. And again, the future board we do is going to be higher as well. That's, that's probably maybe 30 volts too. Um, but um, you know, I, I tend to say if you're making a sort of 200 millimeter square cruiser ratio or whatever, yeah, fine. 12 volts is fine for that. Anything bigger, go for 24. Um, it just keeps the same, it keeps the currents lower, hot end currents lower. Um, about the only disadvantage is you've got to, well, it's easiest if you look for 24 volt fans as well, it saves having a dual voltage system. And 24 volt fans are very available, but some of the nocturnal ones, and uh, the really quiet nocturnal ones. Um, oh, yeah, the other thing, because all duets have got Tranoic drivers on, really, really quiet motion. Um, and the first thing people tend to say when they upgrade to do it is, my fans are too noisy. <laughs> All I can hear is the fans are bit printing. Um, and yeah, the, the Noctua fans are really nice, but they are not currently um, available 24 volt. But Noctua have realised that 3D printing is a big market. They are working on 24 volt versions of their fans. <coughs> so that, that wouldn't be a problem for more than about another um, six months. But you can run. Um, you twelve use a twelve volt fan converter and run your fans off twelve volts or even five volts, you can run the fans off and everything else on twenty four.
Okay, well, if there's no more questions, thank you very much. And if any of you do actually want to see any of this um, demonstrated, then you want me to hang around and I'll, um, I'll run through a few screens. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.